Hello again, and welcome back to Dumpster Dives. Well, this is now turning into a deep dive series on quarter-inch cartridges, so uh, let's just take that again. Well, last time I talked about the original full-size quarter-inch cartridges, but not even a week after I published that video, I received this big box full of mini quarter-inch tapes. Now these are actually from an acquaintance of mine who wants me to read the data from these tapes and see what's on there, and I got permission to talk about the contents of these tapes. But before I get to these, I realized that in the last video I kind of left you hanging about what was actually on the tapes that I recovered the data from. Well, unfortunately it was a little anticlimactic. Uh, a few of the tapes had some boring accounting spreadsheets and documents from some company that's no longer in business. And I guess the most interesting tape was this one, which contains a version of Unix System 5 that's intended to run on a Motorola 68000 processor. I'm not sure how rare or interesting that is. Probably not very. Uh, I might try to run it in an emulator, but um, if you know what to do with it, leave a note in the comments. So let's dive into these mini quarter inch tapes because they deserve a closer look. And I have a feeling that the contents of these tapes will be much more interesting. Now in the last video, I talked about the shortcomings of the design of these cartridges where the tension belt will always fail after a long enough time. Uh, and all of that still applies to these mini cartridges as well. Although I will say that these have held up a little bit better than their larger cousins have. Uh, probably because the tension belt in these is physically smaller, so there's literally less material that can break down over time. And also, these were introduced quite a bit later than the full-size cartridges, so these just haven't had enough time to age yet. Now, all these tapes here are from around 1994-95, and uh, just by feeling one of the tension belts here, I can tell that this is okay. This should work just fine if I put this into a tape drive. But actually, these mini cartridges were first introduced around the late 80s, and uh, I mentioned before that quarter-inch tapes were intended to be a lower-cost technology. Well, these mini cartridges were an even lower-cost technology, because the drive for reading these tapes is one of these. This is a Colorado 250 megabyte tape drive. And this company, Colorado Memory Systems, really spearheaded the development of these drives. And the special thing about this is it connects directly to the floppy disk controller on your motherboard. It repurposes the floppy controller in a way that it wasn't even intended for. When you have this drive hooked up, your motherboard and your BIOS don't even know about this tape drive. But if you have the right software that knows what commands to send to the controller, it can communicate with this drive. And I think that's just great. I like those kinds of hacks that take something that exists and squeeze a little bit more out of it. And in fact, this tape drive can even coexist with other floppy drives you might already have in your system, connected on the same cable. So from a consumer's perspective, what this meant was you suddenly don't need to buy any kind of adapter card, like a SCSI adapter or something like that, and plug this directly into your computer. So that was kind of a game changer, and that certainly helped these drives and these tapes gain pretty wide adoption. And the other cost-cutting factor is really the drive itself. I mean, it does feel a little bit on the cheap side, to be honest. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of plastic components in there. It's really light and feels just a bit fragile. But, you know, it works perfectly well, and hats off to Colorado Memory Systems for doing it this way. Now these drives and these tapes also went through tons of iterations over the years. Uh, when 3M made these cartridges, they actually gave code names to the sort of low-level format that the tape itself was using, and it had cool-sounding Greek letters in the name. So we had things like Gamma Mat, Kappa Mat, Xi Mat, Tau Mat. I'm sure I missed a few in between there, but you get the idea. Some cartridge manufacturers got really fancy, like Verbatim made this type of cartridge. This is a TR3 Extra tape, 2.2 gigabyte capacity, and uh, this is an individually packaged tape. Let's see what's inside this box. We've got the tape itself inside a nice plastic container. There, TR3 Extra. And it even comes with its own backup software on two floppy disks. This is Seagate backup software. And 
a user manual, warranty card, and everything. Fancy stuff. There were also external tape drives for reading these tapes. This drive connects to the parallel port on your PC, which most computers and most laptops had at the time, mostly for communicating with your printer. And this even lets you daisy chain this tape drive from your computer and onto your printer. This is an iOmega Ditto 2 gigabyte tape drive, technically rebranded as a Sony store station, but it's really just iOmega. And I actually really like this drive because it's compatible with a huge range of different capacities of cartridges, uh, starting with the original 80 megabyte version all the way up to the Ditto 2 gigabyte version and everything in between. So this has been really useful. I also have this iOmega Ditto Max drive. This is an internal drive, also connecting to the floppy controller. And this is compatible with even higher capacity cartridges, but not very compatible with lower capacities. So anyway, that's a rough sketch of the hardware that we're gonna use for reading these tapes. But what about the software? At the time when these tapes were in circulation, there were dozens of software packages for making backups, none of which were compatible with each other. All these manufacturers wanted to lock you in to their little ecosystem of backups. There were some attempts at standardization, but unless you know exactly what backup software wrote these tapes, it's pretty hard to guess what it was. Fortunately, we could sidestep all the guessing and just read the whole cartridge at once using Linux. That's going to be our first method of reading these tapes. Just obtain a raw binary dump of the tape, regardless of what format it's in. We just want to minimize how much we mess with the tape. We only want to read it once, if possible, uh, because we don't know how much longer it's going to last. It could last only for one more read, and that's it. Okay, now, here's the tricky part about reading these tapes in Linux. The problem is, modern versions of Linux no longer have the driver that communicates with these old tape drives. So, I'm going to boot my workstation into a really old version of CentOS. That's a derivative of Red Hat Linux. This is an almost 20-year-old version of CentOS. And the reason I'm using this is because this is the most recent version I could find where I could compile the driver for these tape drives and at the same time boots nicely on this workstation so I can actually work with it. Okay, let's try dumping one of these tapes. I'm going to insert the tape into the drive. It takes a minute to identify what type of tape this is. And here we go. Okay, looks like that's working. Yep, looks like the binary file is filling up with data. That's working nicely. So I'm sure that's going to take a while, so uh, we'll skip over all this. All right, so during this time, I actually finished reading some of these other tapes successfully, and now I think I'll finish reading the rest of these using this parallel port external drive, just to make sure it's still working correctly. So here we go. And that's going, we're getting data. I'll finish the rest of these afterwards. Whew, all right, it's been several hours of reading all these tapes, but now they are all safely dumped onto this PC as binary blobs of data. 
Now the process of extracting the actual files from these binary blobs is probably outside the scope of this video. I might do a separate video about that at some point. Uh, suffice it to say, I have some of my own proprietary software for dealing with these kinds of blobs, and it works like this. And we are done. Here are the contents of the tapes. Uh, there's a lot there, but I just want to show you one really cool thing, which is some of these tapes contained a full backup of a PC from 1995. And because it's a full backup, it means that we can emulate it. We can actually see it running in action as it would have looked in 1995. So I'm going to run my trusty DOSBox emulator and set this up. And I will admit I cheated a little bit and I prepared the Windows install here to work with the emulator and also cleaned up any personal stuff from showing up, but otherwise this is exactly as it would have been. Look at that, we got Windows for work groups and oh boy, here we go. There it is, isn't that glorious? Look at all the stuff we got here. Let's see, Delphi, ooh. I used to love programming in Delphi, this was a great IDE, a great language, great way to build applications for Windows 3.1. Uh, oh, look at this. This must have been the exact backup software that was actually used to write these tapes. Connor Backup Basics. Nope, oh, can't detect the tape drive. That's fine. Let's see. Of course, games. Ah, Microsoft Entertainment Pack. Everyone's favorite. Let's see what else. Photoshop 3.0, Visual Basic 3.0, oh, Corel Draw. So this is literally like a time capsule, except it's a time capsule that we can interact with and really feel like we're there. Uh, there's really no other feeling like this. This is peak nostalgia for the 90s. Love it. So just as a little side note, we could have also recovered the data from these tapes using the original software and almost the original hardware. Uh, we can take this same external parallel port drive and connect it to a plain old Windows 98 laptop. And this is running a version of the backup software that happens to be compatible with these archives. And well, this lets you rebuild the catalog of the backup and then you just let it loose and restore the files. But again, the only reason to do it this way is if you know in advance what software was used to write the backups, and assuming you have a computer old enough to actually run the software. Well, there's going to be a ton more stuff to go through in these archives, but um, I hope you enjoyed this little excursion into the world of quarter-inch cartridges. Uh, this technology is long gone and behind us for good reasons, but still gives us a lot more to learn and a lot to appreciate. So once again, thanks for watching and see you next time. Are you still here? I'm playing Chips Challenge. See you later.